welcome back um, everyone to our final session. Um, I really want to start by saying a huge thank you to all of you for joining us for the Shared Futures Conference, whether you managed to join for both days or only dipped in and out. The great news is that every single session has been recorded and all the conference material will be available until 31st of May. Now, overwhelmingly, everyone I've spoken to found it an enriching experience, and I would encourage you to invite everybody you know who works in or has dealings with a sector to access the materials. They can still register on Eventbrite, and they too will have access. You'll get access to the materials again up to May 31st. Interestingly, I got sent a little bit of stats. I mean, everyone knows I like data. It doesn't lie. Do you realize that so far, 420 people have registered for this conference? Now, we asked them to identify themselves as one of four attendee types, whether they were BME leaders, funders, stakeholders, and supporters, you know, or allies. Of the 420 registered, approximately 60 have identified themselves as funders. That represents about 14% of the conference attendees. And for a program which was meant to be 50-50 appealing to both leaders and funders, it hasn't yet met its targets. So there's still quite a bit of work to do to engage funders in sufficient numbers from across the UK. Before I say my final goodbye and hand over to Farah, Farah Elahi, who is um, running me trustee, and she's, cha um, she's chairing the final panel discussion. I'd just like to acknowledge the various contributors and all of you participants who have been busy networking and interacting during the sessions and on the Woover app. I'd also like to acknowledge the funders who have engaged. At the start, I think something that really touched me was Kieran's honest remarks about the lottery's own journey and them challenging their practices and wanting to be better informed this morning, it was also incredible to see Joseph Browntree publicly acknowledging and owning their own failures and pledging accountability on Twitter. During the last session that I attended, I was also pretty pleased to hear Kathy from Lankali Chase share her own experience of exploring implications, how her organization is doing that now, the implications of their historic underfunding. And this is a journey that I believe that most, if not all funders need to undertake. To finish, I'd like to borrow some of the charges that I heard over the course of the last two days. To you participants, I wanna repeat something, you know, that David said, or maybe in the spirit of what David said um, uh, during the plenary, but this is taken from Baljit who you know, is in charge of the Center for Knowledge Equity. She said, stay away from misery narratives. And this is something we all need to remember. Remember who you are, work collaboratively, avoid perpetrating any further injustices and keep doing the great good that you're doing and do it with pride. The funders, I always ask, how are you going to quantify and monitor your commitments? It needs to be public. It needs to be in perpetuity and it needs to be intentional. Somebody asked this same question. And you know why? Because it's not just morally right. It's impossible for us to succeed in our collective mission in a meaningful, congruent and lasting way. And on that note, it gives me pleasure to hand over to Farah and to bid you all goodbye. Enjoy the final session. Thanks so much, Carol. And, uh, you know, you've you've summed up the conference beautifully. And um, thank you for sharing some of what, what you've kind of reflected on over the past two days. Um, so for those of you that have been able to attend the last two days, and for those of us who will be catching up as well over the next few days, you know, the conference has already covered a really wide range of topics from the extent to which funders are applying diversity, equity and inclusion to their practice cooperative governance models, sustainability, participatory funding, how funders can act on structural barriers, knowledge equity and social investment to just name a few. So there's been so many really big and critical questions that have been covered. Um, I think if 
many of you who've been engaging over the last two days will have kind of your probably brains are hurting a little bit someone's already made a cup of coffee to refresh themselves and the purpose of this panel discussion is you know the the instruction that carol gave us is that this is the gentle landing for the conversation this is bringing us home and helping us kind of ease back into our lives um taking forward all the all the wisdom and reflections and learnings that we've picked up um, along the way so I'm really, really excited to be sharing a panel with friends and fellow conspirators in the sector who you know, I've had the pleasure of working with over um, the last uh, few years on, on different projects and thinking about how we, how we kind of um, achieve racial justice in different spheres and spaces. Um, so I'll start by introducing them. Um, and if they use the order that I go in as kind of instruction of the order that I'll come to you into, um, to, Kind of with your reflections in turn. Um, so first up, we've got Safina, who's the director of the John Ellerman Foundation, which is a grant maker in the arts, environment, and social action. I should say I've kind of taken one line out of all of their biographies, which you'll find on the Hoover app because they're all kind of so they've achieved so much and do so many different things. Um, but in order to give more space to hear from their reflections, uh, to hear from them, I've, I've reduced their bios to their kind of current key roles. We've got James, who's the Chief Executive of London Funders, a vital part of London's infrastructure, enabling a network of over 170 funders from all sectors. Um, we've got Halima, who's our Chief Executive at the Running Me Trust, um, and she leads Britain's leading independent race equality think tank. Um, and we've got Michael, who's the Director at the Ubele Foundation, an intergenerational social enterprise with the purpose of building more sustainable communities across the UK. Um, now, when we were discussing this panel ahead of the event, um, I sent through a, a prompt that I wanted each one of the panel panelists to respond to, which was building on lessons from 2020-21, what are the skills, capacities and resources um, you'd, you'd put in a toolkit for a gentle revolution? So thinking about what, what have we learned over the last year and before that, that we need to kind of keep in our toolkit, in our medicine box, as we go forward and, and continue kind of fighting and working for the change that we are um, looking to create. Um, so that's a prompt that our panelists have been given. Um, I'm gonna ask them each to take five minutes to respond to that and share their reflections and, and thoughts. And then there'll be time for some questions as well. So if I go to um, Safina first um, and hand over to her. Brilliant. Thank you, Farah. I'm really pleased to be on this panel and share the virtual stage with James, Halima and Michael, who are all amazing and work for incredible organisations. So thank you for bringing us together. So to the question then, um, I was struck by the use of the word gentle in your question. It made me wonder about the revolutions, gentle or otherwise, that I've been part of directly and indirectly, knowingly and unknowingly. I think it's important to name the fact that you may not always realise that you're leading or part of a revolution. Not all of us will think of ourselves as change makers, revolutionaries, heroes, fighters, winners, and so on. So then, what do I think are the skills, capacities and resources that have served me well in my own experience of supporting effective and transformative change to happen within organisations and sectors that I've worked in? So I'm going to be primarily basing my reflections on the work that I've done in the grant making sector. So I've worked at the National Lottery Community Fund, City Bridge Trust and now John Elliman Foundation. I've also been reflecting as part of this on the work that I did at the Chartered Institute of Fundraising on their equality, diversity and inclusion panel, which led to the change collective movement. And then I also realised that I'm, of course, in reflecting on my own experiences of just operating and existing continually within places and spaces that aren't designed for me or for people like me. So I want to start first with the importance of both insiders and outsiders. All revolutions need both and they require the insiders and outsiders to be able to trust each other and to work together in pursuit of change. That can be really difficult but insiders and outsiders can inform and expand each other's perspectives and can open up new ideas and avenues that need to be explored in order to deliver transformation. So when I worked at City Bridge Trust, I was there as a secondee and I was tasked with setting up their new charitable funding strategy. As an outsider, I was able to work with their team as insiders 
on developing a much more ambitious strategy that resulted in significant changes for them as an organization that I think they weren't expecting. Um, however, in other roles, I've seen time and again, it's as an insider that you can learn about how the organization operates in order to introduce and implement new ideas and approaches to that organization's work. So I think there's something about holding this idea of needing both insiders and outsiders. I think as well that it's really important to trust mixed motives too and celebrate that as an important part of a gentle revolution. We need to name and accept that when we care enough to be part of something important, we're always doing so from a place of both altruism and self-interest. Um, so gentle revolutions for me also require the application of pragmatism and realism in order to achieve brilliant results. So of course, idealism, vision, ambition, all of these things matter. But to get to that point, we need pragmatists and realists who are acting as our root finders that take us step by step to the end goal that we're all seeking. These root finders, wayfinders, are keen observers of the reality in which we operate and they can sense and understand the complexities, the nuances, the uncertainties that are around us and figure out how to respond to those in a creative way. I wanted to add a point about speed as well. There is of course urgency and a need to act fast and that's been clearly the case with the COVID-19 crisis. But we shouldn't strive to have to act fast constantly. Buying time and space isn't a failure and it can be just the thing that's required in order to drill down and do the hard and continuous work that any revolution requires. Sometimes it's in those moments when we're buying time that we can figure out how to bend and eventually break the rules through nudging, testing and escalating ideas and approaches. Buying time or taking time out is also how we can heal and rest. And this will allow us to come back and deliver more and better. And so my kind of final point is that recently I've been reading a lot about the concept of quiet leadership and how quiet leaders are able to effectively uh, judge situations and respond to those. So there are of course many definitions of what a quiet leader is. It's often the person who's delivering change and progress that might be overlooked. And that could be for a myriad of reasons. It could be because they don't have the fancy job title which shows that they're a leader. It could be because they're in smaller or less well-funded organizations, or perhaps they have labels, invisible or otherwise, that others perceive as being less than. Many quiet leaders have the skills, capacities and resources that I've described just now. I passionately believe that any revolution, be it gentle or otherwise, only thrives and succeeds because of the quiet leaders within it. They are the people who are doing the hard and necessary background work through which the building blocks of oppression are dismantled and replaced with this new world order that prioritizes inclusion and justice. Thank you. Thanks, Safina. And lots of questions come to mind, which I'll come back to you with. But if I go to James next to share his thoughts. Thanks, Fella. And it's always uh, impossible to follow Safina, but I'll, uh, I'll do my best. Um, I too, I think, was reflecting on the, the sort of question you were posing to us in terms of gentle revolution. And I think the, the word gentle for me just challenged my own thinking about what we were really trying to achieve. Because I think there's that sense that it can be something quite moderate but there's also the sense that you can be quite kind if you're if you're being gentle and I hope that what you're talking about is that we're going to be kind in how we treat each other and how we take a take forward the revolution rather than that we're trying to be moderate because I think there are some quite big changes that we need to see and that, that I hope we can we can achieve and I think to some of Safina's point I think there are those elements of, of revolution that need that agitation from outside I think we've seen a huge amount of um, upheaval and challenge, uh, as well as distress and, and opportunity and positive stuff over the last year. It's been a real mix of, of things. And I think the nature of that upheaval, the nature of that revolution that we've seen over the last year is something that has, has fundamentally changed some of the conversations that we've had. And I'm hoping that some of that is, is what we can sustain. From where, from where we sit at London Funders, I think quite a lot of the learning of the last year has derived from the work we've done with the funder collaboration on the London Community Response in London that's brought 67 funders together to look at how we fund in a different way uh, in London at a time of crisis and what the learning could be for the future. 
And one of the very early lessons for us was about the importance of putting equity and justice at the heart of, of what we've done. And that's that's been a journey. It's been a, it's been a revolution over the year, I think, in terms of how that, that journey has progressed. And hopefully some of the thoughts I've got will, will sort of reflect on where that learning has, has come from. I think I'll, I'll pick on, on three things. I think one is about um, collaborative wisdom. Uh, one is about funding your friends. And one is about sort of being open and, and transparent in, in what we do. I think the first of those collaborative wisdom is because what's been abundantly obvious, I think, over the last year is that there are a lot of issues that we need to, to face and none of them have easy solutions. Nobody as an individual, nobody as a single sector, nobody as a single organisation has, has everything that you need in order to be able to solve some of the challenges that, that we face. We need to pool our ideas, we need to pool our wisdom, we need to pool our talents if we're going to make an impact on the things that we want to do. And we need to create that capacity for collaborative wisdom. I think as Safina says, sometimes that is about taking your time and, and being thoughtful about how you do this. And I think we, you sometimes need the, the, the confidence to hold that space uh, while you're having those conversations. Because I think at the start of the, the pandemic, there was quite a lot of pressure on us to think about how we could do noticeable and obvious things like ring fence funds for particular communities or particular causes. Um, and we had conversations with partners about whether that was the right approach for us or whether there was something more ambitious that we thought we could do. And through conversations with our equity partners that I'll, I'll come on to in a minute, was about how we wanted to, to take that ambition and be more than just the ring fencing of funds and actually how we could genuinely prioritise through every element of what we were trying to do together, the idea of tackling some of the injustices that there have been in the funding community over many years. So that meant we set ourselves the ambition of genuinely making that priority to do and I'm not saying that's better than an approach to ring fence funds but in terms of what we were trying to do as a new collaboration we felt there was a danger that in ring fencing you might create this idea that you were um you had a target and once you'd hit that target job done you can move on whereas actually if you're trying to work in a system that's a little bit broken and you're trying to change that system and start afresh actually challenging that system and trying to come up with new ways of doing it so that it's just natural that this happens across across the board rather than it's something that a discrete target within a system that isn't working is important and that that collaborative wisdom was what got us to that point of thinking well how do we change this system how do we rebuild this system how do we remove the barriers that we've put over over many years in the way that we redesign what we do and i, I hope that what we've led to as a result is through that collaborative wisdom a much better uh, solution in terms of how funders need to work and that's also the case that that's then spread through all of the funding community that's been working on this. This has been a genuine partnership, this has been a genuine collaboration, and we've all taken on board that intelligence and insight. And that's what gives me a bit of confidence that that's a long-term journey in terms of that revolution being more sustainable because we have worked in a more collaborative way on the wisdom side, as well as on the ways that we've worked together. So collaborative wisdom would definitely be in my in my toolkit. I think the other thing is, is funding your friends. Um, and this is uh, sometimes the problem in the funding sector is that people do fund their friends. I think what I'm talking about here is funding critical friends. So people who actually are genuinely going to be there in the way that your best friends are to really challenge you, to really try and make you be the best that you possibly can be. And what we've achieved over the last year as a, as a collection of organisations just wouldn't have been possible without some, some fantastic friends uh, along the way. And organisations like Michael and New Bailey, uh, Inclusion London, LGBT Consortium, Women's Resource Centre have come on board with us as friends, but it's been important to fund them as friends because it has to, friendship has to be a mutual thing. There's a huge amount of expertise, ideas, talents, experience that we've got from our equity partners, but we need to recognise that that has a value, that has a, a, a benefit to us, and we need to make sure that that's funded and that expertise is resourced so that we try and create a more sustainable structure that means that these are conversations that can continue for the long term. Those critical friends have been really important to us in terms of shaping every aspect of the process through to how decisions have been made and we just couldn't have done it um, without the friends that, that we've had. And I'm really hopeful that the approach that we've been able to take in terms of making sure that expertise and friendship is resourced in that way, again, is a lesson that we need to hold on to for the future. So again, if I was putting together a toolkit for how we bring about change in our sector, be that a, a, a gentle or a fast revolution, I'd want to make sure we were funding our friends as, as part of the process. And I think that links to Safina's point as well about the insiders, outsiders, you know, having some agitation, some criticism, some encouragement from, from slightly outside your immediate circle is what can really drive you forward and encourage you to, to do better at it. So again, fantastic to have had those friends 
on board and I'd like to keep keep them in my toolkit if we if we're allowed to. Um, and the third point really is about that openness and that that transparency and that's the challenge I think that Carol gave to us as well in the in the opening remarks there about the importance about being transparent and open about what we're doing and developing the right tools to share what we're doing so that people can have confidence in criticizing when there's things that we need to improve or in celebrating and taking pride when things have, have gone well and that for me on a very practical level for us is about publishing what we do and sharing openly what we do both the data and some of the discussions that go on behind the scenes that, that inform that data so when you see what's happened with london community response where in the first wave of funding about 30 percent of the grants went to groups that were led by and for black asian and minority ethnic communities when you get through to the most recent wave of grants it's over 50 percent and when you look at equity as a whole when you include characteristics like lgbt deaf and disabled women's led you want about 87 percent of the grants went there which is a massive difference to what you would see in your sort of business as usual funding but being open about that and being open about the journey that gets there including where we've made mistakes uh, along the way is what means that that again is something that's that's shareable that feeds back into that collaborative wisdom and hopefully gives us that platform for for some longer term change so I'm hopeful that this will be a kind revolution, but I'm hopeful it won't be too moderate uh, if we can harness all of those tools and, and that capacity together. James, challenge the question. And also, I think you're an excellent example in the sector of the root finder that Safina uh, described, who finds a way through impossible challenges. Um, next, can I go to Halima to share her reflections on the question? Thank you, Farah, and really, really great to be here speaking to everybody again after listening in on just some, some amazing conversations, sobering conversations in the last two days, but hopefully bringing us forward and closer to a lot more collaboration and unity in the sector. Um, okay, so I've, um, I've, I've not pre-prepared. I'm going to go with what the gut kind of instinctual response should be because we're in a space of authenticity, and I think we should kind of embrace that. Uh, also, I didn't want to repeat what has been said by Safina and James as well. So I'm going to go with, with a gut instinct. Um, gentle revolution, uh, obviously there's an anomaly there because revolutions are not gentle, they're bloody. And yet we do know that everybody who's in this conference right now and outside wants way more change than is possible. And they're not revolutionaries. They just want more change. So in that space, aren't we, with irony, contradiction, but what that space is, is probably a radical space of openness. Somebody far greater than me coined that phrase. What, what does that space of radical openness look like? And it's that intersectional space. And I think in the spirit of that sentiment, I will address your question around skills, capacity and resources. Skills, what would I bring? Um, I'm openly wearing my anti-racism badge and that's not because they work at the running meet it's because every day I have to challenge myself to think about what that means and what that means is I think genuine reflection away from business as usual approaches to diversity and inclusion to what it means to be anti-racist so I've applied in my response to thinking around what that anti-racist approach would mean so skills taking an anti-racist approach I think we have to dig into our own assets and strengths um, being authentic to our own skills, as opposed to uh, building on the skills of other people. Now, what happens when you build on other people's skills and capabilities and strengths is that you end up feeling like you're carrying a deficit model. And the one thing we know in anti-racism space is that we're constantly told that the BME space is a deficit space. The skills aren't there, the capacities aren't there. So I'd flip that and say, use and dig into your own skills, whatever they are, not the other person that you met yesterday and try to kind of mirror what their skills might be for the journey ahead for us. In terms of capacity, again, thinking about the anti-racism approach, which implies that we don't keep looking at the individual, but the system. So it was really great to hear, James, from you, a big focus on the system. Um, anti-racists obviously focus on the system, not the individual. So rather than thinking about building the capacity of the individuals within our sector, I think we go for the big one, don't we? We go towards building the capacity of funders and building the capacity of funders to reflect better on how they can contribute to making change uh, on racial equity and funding the BME sector, the BME-led sector. And finally, in terms of partnerships, and this is where I think I have a few more challenging thoughts. Um, you know, this year, 2020 or 2021, these two years, there's, there's a phrase I keep hearing, which has come from the private sector, but it is a phrase I keep hearing, which is that we want to shift the needle. We, we don't just want to settle for what is 
and we actually want to create a better future and in doing so we want to shift the needle and so even public private business are aligned on this but what does sh shift the needle mean does it just mean tinkering on the edges and funding more diversity initiatives or does it actually mean shifting the needle as you would to turn the dial turning the dial means working and funding organizations in a different way it means investing in organizations that probably are closer to the communities they serve than the ones that we had funded through intermediary organizations. So going directly to uh, black led organizations or disabled people who are leading for their own communities and so on. And you have to have the confidence to invest to those communities. Now, there's a lot of us who are now currently focused on lived experiences, co-creating with lived experience beneficiaries and so on which is good, but that's probably the gentle bit of good. If you really want to get closer to shifting the needle, you probably want to invest directly in BME-led organisations directly, who can be led by BME leaders, who can also be creating co-creative lived experience research, right? Then you get the double impact, maybe even the triple impact. But it also means, I think, moving away from a funding model that's about donations and grants alone, because if we only thought about donations and grants alone, I think it's a kind of drop in the ocean, isn't it? When you want to shift the needle, you want to create a bit of a revolution. You don't have to shout, by the way, to create a revolution, as Sophia said. You can actually quietly do it, can't you? You can actually make that change in other ways. Shouting by itself is, is a burning platform, and you've almost lost by then, isn't it? Because you're so desperate that you've been left behind. You're shouting. And that's needed when we're looking at extremities. You can actually create revolutions by creating more pressure in different ways without shouting. And that means looking at the funding model. And I think we need to ask the question for those organizations that really are committed to changing things from as they were to where we need to be. And I think many of us are in that space now, our funders are. It does mean not just investing with a donation and a grant, it means literally looking at the partnerships that we seek to make. So for example, if your core mission is to eradicate poverty in the UK, which organizations are gonna be leading that? Who are the people most impacted by poverty? Most impacted by poverty in many ways, BME groups, yeah, Bangladeshi families, Pakistan. You need to go to those organizations and let them lead themselves out of poverty. That would be the authentic way to fund. So not just thinking about grants and donations, but actually how do you shift that partnership model to reach more communities in, in, in the way that you need to. And a final thought, I suppose, coming back to, I guess, Runnymede and Runnymede's legacy and reputation. One of the things I heard when I joined this organization um, quite recently was that, um, thank God there are a few people still around to fund the Runnymede. Because there was a period for 20 years when race equity, race equality organizations were not well funded. And you know the story better than I do. But thank God you were here because, you know, what with COVID and the onslaught of Black Lives Matter and God knows what else, thank God you were here and a few others like Rota and so on. You do need to invest in Black-led civil society and its core, because if you don't invest in the core, then we're constantly firefighting, we're constantly reacting, we're constantly being burnt out. We actually cannot realise our full potential. So investing in Black-led civil society should be a core mission, not because it's a good thing to do, though I consider that to be the thing to do, but because if you want to achieve those outcomes in my generation, as opposed to 40 years time, to shift that needle, the very outcomes that each funder has, you can achieve those outcomes at better value for money at a faster rate if you invest in Black civil society to the core, to the core. And you know what that means, having the infrastructure to build core organizations so that come what may, if there's a need for us to kind of challenge and hold others to account, and it doesn't matter who's in power, by the way, it's holding government to account, we can still be standing here to invest in the core facilities of Black and BME-led civil society because it will help us achieve those outcomes that we're committed to achieving, but there's a smarter way to achieve those outcomes. There's a better moral way to achieve those outcomes, to invest in Black and BME-led civil society. Thanks, Anima. You've given us lots of uh, key ingredients that are necessary for, for a healthy sector and a healthy system, from core funding to new forms of partnerships to building on our strengths. Um, so if I can go to Michael next for the final contribution before we open the floor for questions. 
Yeah, Farah, you, you suggested before we started that I should go first. I should have jumped on you and said, yes, definitely I'll, I'll go first <laughs> because now I've got to follow these the, 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 the three people that went before me. Uh, I too had real problems with the idea of a, of a gentle revolution and kind of what that meant and, and what it meant to be gentle and what it meant to have a revolution. I, 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 ended, I ended up in the dictionary <laughs> um, lo looking up revolution and um, uh, f finding that it was about kind of overthrowing, overthrowing systems and and then started wondering about kind of how do you overthrow a system gently? How do you take power from people that hold power gently? I, how, how do you convince somebody to, to hand power over? I, I, I can't think of an example in history where somebody has handed power. Um, and, and so th then I went to kind of the idea that, 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 that the revolution is actually about grabbing power, it's about taking power. It's very ungentle, it's about ripping something out of somebody else's arms. Um, something that I wouldn't give up if I had it. Um, and something that I'm sure other people won't want to give up is kind of the, the ability to, co to control their lives, to control the, the resources around them, to have the resources around them for their own needs. And so, I kind of th th then started thinking, I suppose, about what, what, what it was to be gentle. And, and James has said it was kind, and I, I ran off to the dictionary again and kind of saw things about kind of people being mild and kind and, 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 and showing temperance. And, and, and then started thinking about how I came into the sector and and how I came to be a part of this work and and that many of the people I know took a very similar route into this work and the route in was anger and frustration and disappointment um, and all of those things led to a space where uh, I, I, I didn't want to be gentle with the people who had power um, I actually wanted them to know that I was ripping it out of their hands at the time that I was ripping it out of their hands. And, and then I was speaking with my wife about it and she said, well, perhaps the gentle is not about the relationship between you and the other, but perhaps the relationship, the, perhaps the gentle is about the relationship between you and you. And it's what you have to do to maintain and to protect yourself during the revolutionary state. Um, and, so, and so we together kind of just came up with some ideas about how we look after ourselves during an angry revolution. Um, and I think that, that this particular thing that we talk about as the recent revolution, came out of an incredible world anger um, where we were forced to watch somebody beg for their life under the knees of a policeman. You know, that the, the, what is happening at, at this moment in time hasn't come out of any gentleness and hasn't been gentle. And the movement that has forced us into this space today hasn't been a gentle movement. It has been people ripping down statues and having demonstrations and being angry and coming together in a very angry way to respond to the kind of barbarism of the people that hold power. Um, but we do need to look after ourselves in, in doing that. And, 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 and that's where my wife and I thought that the gentleness came in. And that, so our tools for being gentle during the, revol during the kind of revolutionary stage, during the anger um, and the revolution that we find ourselves in at, at this moment is, is, is one to, to establish boundaries for yourself for, and, and in terms of our organizations, 
Um, I know at Ubele, we, we worked really hard over the past year to just kind of try to establish boundaries around who we are and what we did. Um, because the past year has kind of pivoted and transformed a lot of the practice of our organization. And we've had to move into areas that we didn't see ourselves moving into three months before March of last year. Um, and so one of them was about kind of understanding your boundaries, resetting those where they need to be reset, but actually being clear um, ab about what you do and, and how you intend to do it. Um, assume responsibility for your own kind of emotions and your own feelings. And, uh, and, you know, if I kind of relate these back to Ubele again, is that we spend a lot of time listening to each other, talking with each other, um, both in the workspace, but also outside of the workspace. You know, it's, it's not just about kind of um, what's the next thing we've got to do as an organization, but perhaps sometimes what's the next thing you've got to do as a person? How, 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 do, how do we look after each other as we've had to kind of learn and grow in the way that we've had to learn and grow with the kind of rapidity of, 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 of what's happened over, over, the, over the last year or so. Um, something that's been kind of particularly difficult for me um, in, in this kind of looking after yourself is, is kind of not saying, oh, I'll show them. I, I, I kind of really, I really want people to see how angry I am um, a, lot, a lot of the time, but actually I, I'll show them that idea that you've got to do something to them takes power away from you and, and, and takes some of your ability to look after yourself away from you and is actually a way of giving it over to them. Um, the final thing I'd say is to be really clear with yourself about where and who you take approval from. Um, I know that over the past three or four months, we've had people um, approving of the work that we've done in, in all sorts of ways. Um, and that some of the approval has come from people that, that would like to give us some money to do something else. Uh, but we have to be really careful, I think, and we do all have to be re really careful about from where we take approval, because sometimes approval comes with a different narrative, yeah, to the one um, that you've invested in and to the one that's going to look after you. Finally, I think I'd say, oh no, two things. One, one is about kind of building your army. Yeah, and if you have in a revolutionary state, you, you, you need an army. Um, and when you build your army to take responsibility and, and, and don't be afraid of leading them. Yeah, the, 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 and sometimes you're in the army that you're leading, sometimes you're in the army that other people are leading. But, but don't, be, don't be afraid of leadership. Um, I, I, I'm re really amazed um, at some of the work that we've done in the past, over the past year, where hundreds of people have turned up uh, for meetings and for conversations and to think, um, and that those people, after we've had the event, have come back to us looking for leadership. And one of the things that I'm kind of really proud of the work that we've done is that, is that we haven't just had the event, but we've kind of continued to provide some leadership. Uh, so don't be, don't be afraid of leadership. Don't be afraid to build your army and don't be afraid to build your responsibility. Um, and, and I think that that's what I would say in, 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 in relation to the question. Thanks. Like this is a slight mic drop moment. Like I don't even know how to follow up all those four brilliant contributions, all kind of from very different perspectives, but some common themes coming up through them. Um, so I'm just going to remind the audience also, if you'd like to put questions to the panel, please do put them into the Q&A box um, and I'll try and pull them out. And whilst you're thinking about what questions to add, a couple from me as well. Um, so 
I mean, it's it's. A, I feel like it's such. I, I've taken copious notes, even just from my own reflections and and kind of how I lead my own life. Um, but this idea of kind of quiet leadership, of gentle leadership, of kind leadership, um, of being gentle with yourself, we don't. It's not something you necessarily see a huge amount in a lot of the narrative of revolution and change. Um, and you know, how can we ensure that we? Um, in the kind of in the culture that we have that glorifies individuals as the kind of the change makers or the the kind of the leaders of a movement how do we make space for connection kindness um, and recognition of the each individual that's contributing to this revolution and this journey that we're on Safina, i saw um something that you shared on twitter um i think with one of your with your colleagues with i, I think it was your off, a blog about um the role that your office manager played in the work of the foundation kind of I think that in itself is quite a revolutionary act I think in terms of actually finding space to recognize the contribution of each human being in our movement um, and so just welcome reflections from from the panelists um, and I don't know who wants to go first um, to how do we how do we tell the story of our movement of our of the change that we're trying to create in recognize in and bringing in kindness quietness um, and kind of gentleness with ourselves as well. Safina, you've unmuted, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to you first. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I think it is important that we recognise that we all have a role to contribute. And I think that so much of the narrative is about what we aren't doing, whether it's, you know, have you got the right diet and exercise regimen or, and I'm not meaning to be flippant, but the point being is so much of what we're bombarded with is all of the things that we aren't achieving and the things we're failing at and, you might see things on social media that thinks oh why is my life not like that person's life or whatever it might be so it can feel like quite a deficits based model that we live in and operate in and obviously our world feels smaller at the moment because of the implications of COVID-19 so I think it is really important that we recognize that we all have something to contribute and it's meaningful and it's impactful and we do that in the ways that Michael has spoken about, about kind of lifting each other up and noticing the things that we're doing and saying that, you know, building our army around us or James has mentioned about kind of real friends, best friends that we bring into our kind of um, conversation and, and uh, circle. So I think it's just about recognizing that, you know, the more we rely on the answers coming from single points, then the more that they are open to failing us. So, you know, whether it's some scandal or just them not meeting the expectations that we need. And then when we start to see that we can be part of the solution to the problems that we're experiencing alongside the people that are in our networks and our kind of world, then that's a really, I, I think it can be very empowering and uplifting, but I think we just need to be reasonable with ourselves about not putting this kind of immense pressure that by tomorrow we need to have systemically changed, you know, all of these different things because we are already doing that. We're on that path, we're finding ways through and, you know, we'll look back on, you know, our lives and see that we've been part of an incredible change. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that completely answers the question, but I think it's about really recognizing everyone has something to contribute mm. and that they, they, they are c contributing. Yeah, absolutely. There's something, um, some of you will know uh, the brilliant Mama D um, and she said something really simple to me once, which is just, you know, just if we if we always imagine that every everyone around us has something really valuable and unique to contribute and actually organize our teams, our organizations in that way, rather than entering into these hierarchies of, you know, who contributes in particular ways, just completely changed how we, how we build our organizations. You know, we'd unlock so much uh, additional capacity. And that kind of reminds me of something Halima said in terms of building from our strengths. I think a lot of BME organizations maybe feel are constantly told, you know, your comm strategy isn't strong enough, or this isn't strong enough for your funding approach. But actually, you know, what is the thing that's really unique that, that these organizations are offering that is on the table that is that can't be replicated um, and how do we kind of build from there um does it do any of the other panelists want to jump in or i've got more questions unmute if you'd like to come in um michael and then james i mean i was just thinking um, I, I think it relates to your question but it's the kind of movement and this kind of constant movement that we've got to between the kind of micro and the macro 
and the kind of so so seeing seeing something and seeing each other as the smallest as the smallest unit in the cog um but also then kind of seeing the bicycle kind of rolling down the road and that we've got to keep on and encourage each other to see because in the micro you see these kind of um almost the best expressions of of what we are uh, and you see the things that individual people do and you see that you know i i was um on the grants committee for the very first time in my life <laughs> um th 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 this year and and was privy to people who were doing amazing tiny pieces of work in the areas where they live and the importance of that and and i'm sure that they don't often look up and see the kind of bicycle rolling down the road so so part of it is about how we get people who are doing these tiny but really important pieces of work running dominoes clubs or disabled groups or you know to to see that they are part of a bigger force hmm. but also it's about how do we get this kind of big machinery um that kind of happens at this kind of systemic levels and people who come to conferences and talk about systems change and stuff how do we get them to continuously relate back down to the to the micro and i think it's mm -hmm. that kind of movement and how the more we can increase that movement is the more that we're able to kind of see the picture and look after each other in it mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and and never for once you start going to the conferences, never forgetting that actually you you, you are the same as the person organizing the Dominus Club. Actually, you're you're one in the same. One of the um, ecological analogies that I find really compelling is about you know um, the Fibonacci sequence and the, the pattern that the same pattern that exists at a micro level is the one that's mirrored at the macro level. And that kind of understanding of we have to get that micro level right if we want to get the mic macro right as well um, Halima you've you've come off mute so I'm going to come to you next um yeah I think I think call it quiet revolution or call it building the sector or the movement and the movement is democratic by nature isn't it so everyone has a role has a voice to play and I think increasingly we're recognizing the last two years in particular so those of us who are revolutionaries I should add by the way revolutionaries generally do know that they need to build movements but then there are those of us who aren't revolutionaries but suddenly realize I think in the last two years what with Black Lives Matter that actually we are part of a movement that we're in it and for those of us in this movement I think it's understanding just the real importance of each of our voices in that democratic way and for those of us who might have more power or privilege um, and some of us do have more power and privilege to step aside let's really step aside and if you are giving fire to the sector, to civil society, one of the first responsibilities you have, if you have any privilege, is to step aside and allow others that haven't been used to holding that space to speak. There's that phrase I constantly hear about giving people a voice or empowering other people as though they don't have the power. They've always had the power. Step aside and they will have their views heard. We become that problem, don't we? Because we're constantly needing to be heard as individuals with egos in social media with a lot to say. So build up that movement. It doesn't have to be about the shout. Michael, I take your point that the shouting is, we've come from a shouty angry place because actually it's been so barbaric, but even taking away the last 12 months, I think you can create that revolution by not shouting, by not putting so much emphasis on the, on the individual. Um, I think we need to work hard around creating democratic spaces for all of us, take the pressure off as well. That's the other thing I was going to add around well-being. We've created a situation where everyone feels like they're in an oven, pressured oven of some kind, where you react in the wrong way. If you can make everyone feel safer, you can actually create more allyship and solidarity. And I think those of us who are on the anti-racism movement are about allyship. It's those of us who aren't on it that are about creating and ramping up the pressure and creating fake emergencies that need to be managed, right? So be kind, give up that space, step aside, hear everyone's voice. Thank you. James, over to you. I mean, I think I agree with what everyone else has said. I think for me, there's also something about the, to recycle a point from my opening remarks, that collaborative wisdom space, which is actually about creating some of the space for learning 
and being very open about that learning and, and trying to make sure that's always built into how we're approaching things. So I think you don't, people don't always know whether they're a revolutionary and people don't always know whether they're causing a revolution until you take a step back and realize what you've what you've achieved or what you've done. And I think we've certainly found when we have had some learning spaces as part of the, the funder work we've done over the last year, that people start talking about things, think, well, do you not realize that how that has sort of filtered through and what a change that has made, what the knock-on effects of, of that was. And some of it's sometimes really, it feels like really small things, but that someone will have a conversation with a group of funders as part of the collaboration, will go back to their office team chat, you know, virtual space and be saying, oh, we had this conversation. And then everybody starts having that conversation and then everybody starts to challenge based on what that comes in. And it's that sort of, I'm not very, I'm not very clever really, but what's the, the butterfly thing? That domino effect. Dominoes, dominoes is also the other thing. I think the, you see that happening in the funds world, but you also see that happening. I'll come back to dominoes actually. I've got a dominoes point in a minute, but the, you see that in terms of how, um, when you get when you get together and when you when you share that learning we've certainly seen when funders have come together and have looked at applications that have come in in the round they've seen applications from groups they've never heard of they've never experienced they've been able to develop relationships with they've been able to expand their learning their understanding their um ability to engage properly and on, on more equal terms in the in the future and i think that again you didn't start out thinking this is going to be a revolution but it's it's caused quite a revolution in the way people have thought or the way that they're intending to behave in the future um and i think also this is michael's dominoes this is what triggered the thought in my head was that it's also about how funders share learning about what we talk about and how we talk about it because i think sometimes that creates a bit of an exclusive club unless people are open about the learning that they're they're doing and i think michael's example of, of the dominoes if you if funders shared their learning a bit more you'd know that that wasn't people playing dominoes you'd know that actually what you were doing there was building social cohesion and tackling isolation in marginalized communities and etc cetera, etc cetera. and actually unless we have those conversations and either expose the ridiculousness sometimes of what we do in the funding uh, community to sort of package things up and try to make them sound different to what they they really are unless we have some of those conversations to share that learning openly between funders but also more openly with civil society groups and communities we're never going to level that that playing field and, and really properly understand each other uh, in ways that we need to so um a random thing that ended with dominoes uh, apologies i'll stop now thanks james no really really powerful remarks and i'm going to come back to each of the speakers for a final uh, kind of sentence or, or thought to share which will asking you guys what's one hope you have for the future which is actually the theme of uh, this panel originally but I hope Carol and those attending will not mind that I co-opted it slightly and I'm going to whilst I give the panelists a, a minute to think I'm going to share a quote which kind of inspired the co-option of this uh, discussion um, which is from an author Resma Menekum in, in his book My Grandmother's Hands um, and the quote is change culture and you change lives you can also change the course of history Many well-meaning social activists overlook this essential fact. They focus relentlessly on strategy, but strategy means nothing to our, lizard to our bodies and our lizard brains. When strategy competes with culture, culture wins every time, which is, which is a kind of what inspired the question, because I think, you know, we, we, the previous two days, people have spent talking about strategy and what to do and, and practicalities, but I think there also needs to be space to think about how we look after ourselves, how we build our teams from, from a, a, a place of uh, kindness and quietness um, in order to have the revolution. Um, and yeah, I think definitely by gentle revolution, uh, we did it, well, it was open to interpretation, but definitely when I was thinking about it and speaking about it with my partner, we were thinking not necessarily about uh, something that's uh, nice, but something that is, uh, that gentleness itself is revolutionary in our world uh, today. But I'll come back to the panelists and if they don't mind me going in the order that they um, shared their initial comments in. So I'll come to Safina first to share one hope you have for the future. Oh, gosh. Um... I think for me, there is something about being in that kind of learning and evolving mindset always and recognizing, you know, taking space to celebrate and appreciate the abundance and the wins, uh, but using that to fuel the onward work and the progress that's still lacking. And, um, you know, I'm really struck by a quote about how you can live the life you've always imagined and I feel that that's really possible for um, communities that are being 
marginalized and othered and I see how that is becoming more possible day in day out um but I'm not you know ignoring the fact that not enough progress has been made and that there are really deep systemic issues that need to be addressed urgently but for me I, I want to kind of be in that mindset of learning and building upon the abundance that's already there using that to fuel what we do next and to live the life we've always imagined thanks thanks Safina um James I guess my my hope would be that we can be a bit more human um in the future I think we we too often sort of separate out the personal and the the professional I, I, we need to do it in a careful way, taking on board points about well-being and, and resilience. But I think, you know, sometimes in the funder world, we talk about we need to bring people in with lived experience, but we forget that we've got some lived experience too. And we think we're professional, but we forget that other people are professional too. And we sometimes create some of these, these false barriers. And I think if you think about it in terms of your, your personal life, if a friend comes and asks me for money because they want to achieve something or they want me to sponsor them or support them for for a cause they care about or change that they want to make i'd give them the money i'd trust them i'd know that that's what you know that they wanted to do and i'd believe in them i don't ask them to report on outcomes and and tell me that for for the 10 pounds i gave them they cured parkinson's i don't expect that but yet we do that when we when we go into our into our day jobs and there's something about sometimes as funders we can leave that sort of sense of humanity at the door and, and get a bit too focused on process and the sort of practicalities of funding. So I'm hoping that in a way the last year where we've been, we have been a bit more human, you know, we've been talking to each other in our own homes. We've sort of seen our whole lives through partners, children and pets sort of walking around in the in the background of shop. And I, I hope we don't forget that. And I hope we do hold on to the, the sort of humanity of it and actually treat each other as such in the future rather than trying to create some of these divisions between people and between communities that shouldn't exist and in, in our real lives don't exist, but we can sometimes create those barriers as a result. So be a bit more human would be my hope uh, for that. Excellent uh, contribution. Um, Halima, over to you. I'm probably gonna go back to a comment I made around investing in uh, black and BME led civil society. Because, and I say this because as some of you will know that I came back to the running meet after 25 years and I was just struck by how few black led organizations were working at a national level to just hold that space, hold. If you look at uh, the civil society space in general, there are many, many organizations, um, white led organizations that are doing an amazing job, right? an amazing job. But that black led civil society is missing because it's not invested in. So if you are listening uh, as a funder, the core question we need to ask is how do you invest in the core black led civil society groups to re retain that critical mass that is needed to power our movements and without that it feels almost punitive exploitative asking individual leaders to burn out year after year but yet amnesty and liberty and child poverty action group have the resources to do what they do don't expect anything less of us Thank you, Halima. And Michael, over to you. I think you're on mute. There, there had to be one time in, in no, the conversation. No, no, no. And I do, it, I do it all the time. Um, I think mine has kind of something about kind of narratives and how do we, how do we allow, how do funders allow, uh, how do policy makers allow uh, uh, black and ethnic minority people to define the narrative. I, I think that the most important thing that funders do isn't just to give money, um, but they decide what they're giving money for, and therefore they decide the language that we need to speak about our work in. Um, and um, I, 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 I've worked with voluntary organisations for the past 40 years and I've never been able to speak the language. I'm kind of learning it now working with Yvonne to be quite honest because Yvonne uh, is, is a past master at that language. Um, but I don't think, in a, in a way I kind of resent having to learn it um, because I think that actually one of the things I would hope in the next year is that they spend some time and spend some energy learning the language of those micro organizations and that they 
prioritize the things that those people think are important so that the important narrative from which you're funded is the narrative that's coming out of people who are actually involved there doing the face-to-face -face work. Really, really um, important reflections, uh, Michael, and, and all of our panelists. And um, I just want to take this opportunity to give a big thank you to all the panelists, all the people that joined for the conversation, all the people that maybe watched it later and hopefully got some wisdom for it. So um, if you were building your toolkit, um, what our panelists have told us today, these are some critical things that you should try and put in your toolbox um, for a gentle revolution. Think about your role as an insider outsider. Um, think about those the way in which you might be a wayfinder for the revolution, finding a way forward. Um, think about the importance of quiet leadership, collaborative wisdom, funding your friends, openness and transparency. Think about that from a radical perspective. What does radical openness look like? Make sure you're being authentic to your skills and your strengths. Um, think about how we need to invest in the core, not just of ourselves, but also of our organizations and of our, of our movements. Um, remember to be gentle to yourself, build your army and don't be afraid to lead that army and also assume responsibility for yourself. So lots of really, really important wisdom that's come out of that session. I hope that adds to and builds to all of the insights and kind of incredible contributions that have been made over the last two days. Um, so big thank you to everyone. Big thank you to Carol, um, our brilliant runny meter who's put this whole thing together. And I know it's been very, very stressful, but as always, she's done it with, with grace and um, so much of her own wisdom. Um, those of you that don't know, I'm a current trustee, but a former runny mead staff member. Um, and Carol, a lot of uh, the, the Carol is definitely one of those quiet leaders who's leading a gentle revolution. Um, so big thank you to her and to Halima and all of the team for kind of pulling all of this together and bringing us together for this conversation. So thank you all um, and enjoy the rest of your evening.